This is a report on Korea. It is a report on what you and your church are doing in Korea. Of how you gave more than one and a half million dollars through the Bishop's Appeal Fund to aid the Korean Methodist Church in time of critical need. It is a report on how these dollars are being spent. More than this, it is a report on people. People who live in noisy, thriving cities and in quiet country villages. People who have the same problems, same affections, same dreams as you do. To make this report, which you will hear and see, the Methodist Church sent a man to Korea to study the projects being made possible by the Bishop's Appeal Fund and by World Service Giving. This man is more than a reporter. He has a sincere love for the Korean people and a deep concern in our church's complex program of assistance. This man, who was flown to Korea so he could report directly to you, is Bishop Richard C. Raines. I returned to Korea once again as liaison bishop between American and Korean Methodism. My assignment, to see the wonders wrought through your sacrificial gifts. I traveled the length and breadth of the Republic, from Eastern Sea to the Yellow Sea, across jagged ranges of the mountainous interior, and everywhere I saw a people in travail. Here is a nation whose culture goes back 4,000 years. The real origin of her people is veiled by antiquity like the morning mist that rolls in from the Yellow Sea, shrouding her ancient shrines, hovering in stillness over the shops and homes and marketplaces. The Korean people today have adopted Western ideas while retaining many of their old customs, methods of transportation, and manner of dress. The people in the villages live in thatched dwellings with mud sidewall construction. Roofing is a perennial problem. Where our roofs last for dozens of years, the Korean, nearly every year, must replace the old with the new. Straw is as precious as wood and is sorted and stored with the same care as a lumberman receiving a new shipment of timber. Some is used for mats, some for rope, and some for bedding and fuel. But the largest supply goes into roofs. All the family joins in this project, sorting the straw, weaving the crown of the roof. It takes family cooperation in Korea to keep the home intact, to keep father, mother, and youngsters clothed and fed. Each member must make a contribution. This is one reason why the family ties in Korea are very strong. After the day's work, the family group gathers with its neighbors to relax and share the day's problems and enjoyments. These moments away from the monotonous routine and hard physical labor of household chores are precious ones indeed for the women folk. It is a welcome respite, even though the cares of motherhood are never far away. Korean women are strong and toughened to a rigorous existence. They have known high moments of happiness, as all women do. But mostly, they know of back-breaking toil from sunup until long past sundown. On wash day, the family laundry is taken to the nearest source of running water, not to the laundromat. And mothers literally pound out the dirt by beating and scrubbing the clothes on rocks. The process of ironing requires two women with an acute sense of rhythm. By using two finely polished sticks, they gradually beat their linen and clothes into smooth surfaces and neat folds. Korea is indeed a nation of contrasts where ancient and modern form an incongruous backdrop to everyday living. The contrast is found everywhere, even on the busier roads, where unexpectedly the truck, product of 20th century technology, meets the ox cart, 
product of an older artisan culture. Or, in the recess of a serene valley, a gleaming Buddhist shrine carved in a huge boulder. Both Buddhism and Confucianism have made a contribution to Korea, but neither of them have become so implanted in the hearts of the people as to constitute a real challenge to Christianity. The early culture of Korea evolved in the large river basins and on the sea coast. The extensive fisheries in the surrounding water have been an important source of income and food. Waterways have provided the primary means of travel, by river or by the sea in going from one coastal port to another around this mountainous peninsula. It was over these water routes, too, that Korea became linked to Japan and eventually to the Western powers. In spite of 40 years of Japanese domination, the Korean people clung tenaciously to their ideals of freedom. The missionary was their only friend, and the Christian faith their source of power. Koreans developed a pattern of life that was a mixture of old and new. Then on June 25, 1950, as the first rays of the sun touched the land, the armies of North Korea launched an attack across their southern boundary, the 38th parallel. Once again, Korea, land of the morning calm, was mercilessly ripped and wrenched by war. Korea has always been a battleground because of her strategic position as a land bridge between the Asian mainland and Japan. Generation after generation had known subjugation and suffering, but nothing in the past compared to this. The war swept everything in its path like a giant tornado. Nothing was spared. Not the government buildings of old Korea, not the Russian embassy. Families were uprooted from their homes, separated from the peace and security they had been building so long. They packed their belongings on their backs and fled from the path of destruction. They moved southward in long columns, a few miles each day and on foot. When it was over, they came back to their familiar surroundings, more often than not to find their homes in shambles. Then, the long task of trying to piece together a new life. The homeless mothers and fathers and children made out somehow. I don't understand how, but they did. They took bits and scraps of wood and canvas and metal and pieced together makeshift homes barely large enough to turn around in, yet home for four, five, six, or more. This hole in the earth is the entrance to a home sheltered by a piece of canvas. It was conditions such as these which six Methodist bishops saw on visits to Korea after the truce signing. Sensitive men could not remain aloof to what they saw. The Methodist church must act, they told their colleagues. These things demand attention, and now. The bishops had seen a maimed youngster hunting for food. They had seen a mother tramping wearily day after day, picking up coal fallen from passing trains. Coal to warm her children when snow and biting wind swept down across the spiny ridges from Manchuria. They had seen the wretched living conditions, the rows on rows of squalid huts, the crowded shacks, the cold, the tuberculosis, the rats, the vermin, and the starvation, which ravage the body, suffocate the spirit, dull the mind. And they have seen children who will live with memories of hardship and privation the rest of their days, and yet, in the face of it all, manage a show of cheerfulness. And they had seen children with no place to go. If ever there was an opportunity for our church to make a substantial contribution to the Christian cause, this was it. The Council of Bishops listened to the report of their colleagues and then issued an appeal. The call for funds went across our nation to and you responded with gifts totaling more than one and one half million dollars. This hope and help which you made possible soon began to reach the Korean people through the Division of World Missions and MCOR, the Methodist Committee for Overseas Relief. 
some of your gifts went to projects like the War Widows Home Program at Tajan and Seoul. These structures being built under MCOR supervision will house dozens of women and children whose husbands and fathers were killed in the war. Here is one answer to refugee conditions. Actually, these projects are more than housing developments. Each one has a workshop. Here, widows are able to support themselves by employing their skill at weaving and sewing and other productive crafts. Hours once spent in idleness and loneliness become filled again with creative activity. To many of these women, the workshop has meant the difference between a life of emptiness and one of hope for the future. They feel a sense of usefulness to their society. But the War Widows program is only one of Methodism's undertakings. Elsewhere in Tajan, activities of quite a different sort go on, a work also supported by your gifts. The work begins with this raw material. Out of shapeless pieces of wood, the expert woodcarver shapes a whole new way of life for many of Korea's war amputees. He cuts and carves using great caution and precision until gradually the wood takes definite form. It becomes alive. In his skilled hands, new hope is born for the amputee. Woodworkers and therapeutic technicians literally rebuild men at the Tajon Amputee Center. They make many types of artificial limbs here, each requiring exact adaptation to the physique and needs of the user. For the farmer, the craftsman constructs a special leg these have a broad base designed to help the farmer keep his footing in the soft rice paddies. After careful construction comes the fitting. One day the limb is put to the practical test. It is a day not soon forgotten by these men who come to the center from all parts of the country. Yet it is one thing to build an arm or leg and it is something else to build a sense of self-assurance and confidence so that they can stand with their fellow countrymen, not ashamed, not feeling inferior. It is to this part of the work that the amputee center gives its greatest care and effort. Could you believe that one of these boys came only with stumps of arms and legs? The day I visited the center, the men were fascinated by my camera, wanted to learn how it worked. Their quick interest was an indication of their alertness, a sign of growing wholeness and health. Severance Hospital and Medical Center in Seoul was about 85% destroyed by the war. Through your generosity, it is being rebuilt. Working quietly in his laboratory, the scientist seeks effective ways to combat tuberculosis and other diseases. Aided by funds you have supplied, Severance is also Korea's chief hope for more adequately trained doctors and nurses and medical technicians. At Severance, medical students learn not merely of organs and ailments, but about people. They learn the Christian meaning of the vow taken by all physicians, the Hippocratic Oath, which states, into whatsoever house I shall enter, I will go for the benefit of the sick. But with the present facilities, not one in 50 Koreans who need medical care can find it. As a result, the American 8th Army, in honor of its dead, is giving Severance a large new building. Eventually, the hospital and medical college will be relocated at Chosun Christian University. The university resembles most American campuses and it is typical of South Korea's institutions of higher learning. With help from the Bishop's Appeal Fund, in cooperation with other denominations, the university is expanding its facilities to accommodate a rapidly growing enrollment. A recreation hall for women students was only recently opened.
Soon, other buildings will follow, both here at Chosun Christian University and at other colleges and secondary schools throughout the country. At this moment, the doorway to learning stands ajar for more Koreans than at any time in their history. Another large educational institution is Iwa Women's University, which is thronged with 5,000 young women determined to secure an education. I went to Iwa to participate with Bishop Hyungi Liu in the dedication of a new auditorium. Our task was to lay the cornerstone. The whole student body turned out that day, and I heard them sing in strong, clear voices. It was a moving experience. Bishop Liu spoke first, and then I was invited to speak to these friends of Korea, whom I hold in such esteem and love. President Helen Kim interpreted for me. The auditorium construction moves ahead slowly. Many man hours of hard labor must go into it before it is finished. But one day it will be ready for use, and when it is, it will be the largest such structure in Korea. Here, all the students of the university can meet at one time, and large civic gatherings will also be held here. Our Women's Society of Christian Service gives direct support to Iwa University and Iwa High School. Despite these splendid facilities, vast numbers of Korea's children who live in the country do not have access to them. Indeed, 800,000 South Korean children cannot attend school. And so Wesley clubs are being formed to give as many children as possible at least 10 months of elementary education. By using their church buildings and by carefully training their own teachers, Korean Methodists are making a beginning. 184 Wesley clubs are now functioning, enrolling 16,000 boys and girls. For every dollar given, a Korean child can receive one year of elementary and religious education. A high point in my itinerary was a visit to Pajai High School in Seoul. It is one of the two Methodist high schools for boys in the capital city, and it is the school from which President Sigmund Rhee had been graduated just before the turn of the century. Later in his home, I had the opportunity to talk with President Rhee, and he reminisced about his days at Padjai and the profound influence it had on him. By the time he was ready to graduate, he had been greatly moved by the ideals and spirit of democracy he had found there. In 1894, he joined the Independence Club, which pressed for democratic reforms under the Korean monarchy. Ten years later, he traveled to the United States and there eventually received a B.A. degree, then an M.A. degree at Harvard, and finally a Ph.D. in theology at Princeton. President Rhee's many years of political exile and imprisonment have only strengthened his stubborn convictions that Korea must be free, united, independent, and Christian. The playground of Shina Day Nursery was only a few years ago a command post for a military unit. These are the same children who were scattered over the map of Korea during the war as families fled and were often torn apart. They lived like animals and they reacted like wild creatures to sudden movements or sounds. Happily, all of this is changing. The youngsters in the oversized army boots, in the matted dirty jackets, they are being cared for. The youngsters who follow the soldiers with their shoeshine boxes, hopefully calling after the GIs, Shine Joe, these kids are once more following the normal pursuits of childhood. Now they pummel one another, play their traditional games, and fly to the moon on rocket ships expertly fashioned by hand from the metal of wartime gasoline drums. <laughs> and your money is helping theological students also. At the Methodist Theological Seminary in Seoul, a significant group of men and women are preparing for careers as ministers and Christian teachers. 
they continue a work first begun in Korea many years ago by missionaries and carried on by succeeding generations of Christian pioneers. These faithful disciples have made Korea a bulwark of Christianity in Asia. Many new churches are being constructed, a great number being built through the generosity of American Methodists. These churches dotted the countryside wherever I traveled. Some are in rural areas, others in crowded metropolitan centers. Often as not, the site is a high hill, which means a long, laborious trek for the workmen hauling the materials of the new church. These blocks weigh hundreds of pounds. The average American would have extreme difficulty lifting such a load, much less carrying it to higher ground. But as our soldiers found out, most Koreans are capable of transporting unbelievably heavy burdens. Koreans are breaking ground for their new churches as rapidly as they can organize new congregations. Within three years' time, some churches have grown from 40 members to 400. They are building with purpose, with ingenuity, and sometimes with raw courage. The reminders of war are overshadowed by other, more significant sights and sounds, like rope and scaffolding, like the noise of hammer against nail of saw against wood. About 234 Methodist churches are nearly rebuilt or repaired by your contributions and there are requests for 150 more. These buildings will be used not only on Sunday, but every morning at five o'clock for a prayer meeting when at least 50% of the members will be present. The architectural style varies from place to place. But the purpose is one, to bring the message and teaching of Jesus Christ to the people, no matter where they live or what their station in life. There are 782 Methodist churches in Korea. Their influence cannot be measured, but it extends far, even to the threshold of opposing nations. Along the 38th parallel, the church is a symbol of hope. Here at first, the people meet in tents. These two are churches crude perhaps, but fulfilling their mission in one of the vital areas of the world, where ideologies of East and West are struggling for the minds of men. The tents are being replaced by durable, useful buildings as fearless modern apostles reclaim for Christ this war-ravaged area. Another effective means of telling the Christian story is through the radio broadcasting at station HLKY at Seoul. This station was damaged during the war, but with gifts from many denominations, including the Bishop's Appeal Funds, it has been repaired and expanded. From its studio, teams of actors, writers, directors, now fill Korean radio receivers with a variety of programs, many of a religious nature. The Korean Methodist Church is an independent body. It is led by Bishop H.J. Liu, from the church's headquarters in Seoul, he supervises more than 600 pastors and preaching stations. His desk and his heart are the focal points for the sufferings and hopes of 80,000 Methodists. On him rests the major responsibility for administering the funds you contributed and reporting on their use and directing the work of the missionaries. One of Bishop Liu's foremost concerns is for the welfare of his rural parishioners. In the cataclysm of war, agricultural production came to a sudden halt. Soldiers plundered the farmyards, killed the livestock, carried off supplies, and ruined the rice fields. But, little by little, the people of South Korea have been restoring their economy. Each harvest brings more abundant crops. Through the bishop's appeal alone, $115,000 has been established from which farmers and small businessmen borrow money to start their farms and private businesses. The MCOR cow distribution program receives its main support from the Bishop's Appeal Fund. The cows are owned by the churches, which lend them to farmers too poor to own one. Their arrival in the villages is a great event. 
but actually, to the Korean family, she means machinery, transportation, and finally, food. She has worked hard in preparing the soil for the season's planting. Because of her strenuous work in the fields, she gives very little milk. But through MCOR, a program to introduce dairy cows is gaining in favor. The villages and farms are the place where the level of the standard of Korean nutrition will be determined. The time had come for me to return to America. Numbers of students, children, church leaders, and laymen, typical of Korean courtesy and friendliness, came to say goodbye because they wanted me to carry their gratitude to you for your prayers and gifts. Gifts which have supported in a major way the War Widows Project, the Amputee Center, Severance Hospital and Medical Center, Chosun Christian University, Iwa University, Padja High School, Shenade Nursery, the Chungyong Baby Home, the Methodist Theological Seminary, Station HLKY, the Dairy Cow Program, and the building of churches. All of this. But when I look back on my trip, I remember the people and their faces, their wonderful faces.